On the second anniversary of the 911 attack on the World Trade Center, George Bush asked for an $87 billion increase in military spending. At the same time, the media released a dramatic video showing Osama bin Laden alive and well and threatening to make the 911 attack seem like foreplay. How much do we really know about America's favorite villain? Multimillionaire Osama bin Laden was the 17th of 52 children fathered by a wealthy construction baron named Mohammed bin Laden, who had close ties to the Saudi royal family and the Bush family. In 1979, the American CIA and Pakistan's ISI financed an anti-Soviet group in Afghanistan and provoked a profitable 10-year war with the Russians. When the Russians invaded Afghanistan, the CIA hired Osama bin Laden to recruit and train Al-Qaeda fighters to fight the Russian army. Invasion. Anti-communist guerrillas in Afghanistan have been at the front line to fight against the spread of communism. But what was the fight really all about? Not carrots or potatoes. It was about poppies, endless fields of opium poppies that provide over 70% of the world's heroin supply to heroin addicts worldwide. These are very uncomfortable issues for politicians. It was a dramatic story, but the media failed to tell us the less heroic side of Afghanistan's freedom fighters. America's new friends had become hooked on the economics of the poppy. During the war, many of the Mujahideen radically increased the production of opium, the raw ingredient of heroin. The international drug trade began in 1606 when Queen Elizabeth I built England's wealth by trafficking illegal opium from India to China. British East India Shipping Company and profited handsomely not just from drug trafficking but from trafficking African slaves with her slave trader John Hawkins. first knighted her slave trader with the noble title of Sir John Hawkins. By 1830, the British had distanced themselves from dope dealing by granting opium monopoly rights to the Jewish Sassoon family who became known as the Rothschilds of the Far East. As an agent for the Crown, David Sassoon shared his dope profits with Queen Victoria. The British East India Company built a major factory to process the opium here at Kaisapur. It's still a lucrative earner for the Indian government, which sells opiates to the world's pharmaceutical industry. When the Chinese banned opium and destroyed 600 chest loads of the addictive drug, Sassoon and the British retaliated. It was a financial disaster for the British. With huge profits at stake, they retaliated with the Opium Wars of 1843 and 1858. The forces of the market were to defeat China's moral prohibition. Sassoon and the British forced drug addiction onto an entire nation, stole the island of Hong Kong, and made Hong Kong the capital of the British international drug trade. In 1872, Queen Victoria knighted David Sassoon's son, Albert Sassoon, who spread the illegal opium trade throughout China and Japan. In 1887, Sir Albert Sassoon married Aline Carolyn Rothschild and joined the pirated fortunes of the Sassoon drug cartel with the Rothschild money cartel. Today, it's business as usual for the descendants of the Sassoon and Rothschild families who socialize with Queen Elizabeth II 
and Prince Charles as elite members of Britain's inner power circle. Many have been granted royal titles, like Sir, Countess, Baron, and Marquis, but their many victims aren't fooled by the crowns, the titles, and the tuxedos. They have very different titles for them. Titles like liars, thieves, dope dealers, and mass murderers for the crown. On the other side of the Atlantic, a member of the same opium smuggling syndicate, Samuel Russell, founded Yale University's Skull and Bones Brotherhood with drug money. Exclusive members were financed into political power positions in the CIA, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the White House. When Skull and Bonesman George Bush Sr. became CIA director in the 1980s, the CIA recruited Osama bin Laden to train Al-Qaeda and Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan. The job of Osama's trainees was not just to fight the Russian communists, it was to run Afghanistan's multi-billion dollar opium trade. Heroin, manufactured from Afghan opium, supplied 250 to 300 billion dollars annually to Wall Street and the U.S. banks. Authors Alfred McCoy and Michael Levine tied the CIA to this unholy drug alliance and received national attention when the CIA tried to suppress their books. Michael Levine became a best-selling author when he wrote about his experience of this unholy alliance. After 30 years distinguished service with the DEA, he could write with some authority. You could look at what they did to me in, uh, as a, uh, an example in microcosm of Central Intelligence's actions and the State Department in uh, completely subverting the drug war. You know, the drug war was something that only existed in the minds of Americans, on the streets of America, for kids like my brother, for cops who died. There, there was no drug war. The biggest drug dealers in the world were given a license to sell drugs to Americans to support themselves. And this continued right down from Southeast Asia, through the Mujahideen, through the Contras. But how was the heroin smuggled into the United States? One of America's most gruesome secrets is that during the Vietnam War, heroin was smuggled into the United States by hiding it inside the body bags of dead American soldiers. By the end of the 1960s, one-third of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam and close to one million United States citizens were hooked on heroin. Drugs like LSD, mescaline, marijuana, and hashish also swamped the streets and college campuses of America. Who or what turned America's youth onto these illegal drugs? Celebrity anti-war activists like Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary, Allen Ginsberg, and Bertrand Russell sold America's youth on acid rock, tripping out, and one world government. Their financing came from the Warburg Banksters and IPS, Institute for Policy Studies. Over 100 million doses of LSD that hit the streets of America were purchased by Timothy Leary and Alan Dulles through S.G. Warburg's Sandoz AB Pharmaceutical Company in Switzerland. Free sample size packages of acid were handed out not only on college campuses, but at rock concerts where musicians persuaded millions of fans to get high. Critics of the drug culture blame parents, teachers, law enforcement, and everybody except the people behind it all, namely the Rothschild Warburg Banksters and their Committee of 300. According to Dr. John Coleman, who wrote the story of the Committee of 300, 
The Beatles rock group were brought to America by the Tavistock Institute. Tavistock launched the drug culture revolution in America to popularize and normalize social drug use. Through their record companies and advertising monopolies, the banksters have packaged and financed their celebrity salesmen to anesthetize, addict, and enslave billions of people worldwide with dependencies on both prescription and non-prescription, legal and illegal drugs. Those drugs range from alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine to Prozac, crack cocaine, and heroin. Like the phony war on terrorism, the phony war on drugs is a cat and mouse game being fought with one hand and fed with the other. The peace symbol adopted by the drug flower children of the 60s 